Let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we continue in our verse-by-verse study of the gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at the first 15 verses of Matthew 10 this morning. The title of the message, The First Missionaries. The First Missionaries. Let's look together at God's Word. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Prove neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. One of the foundational elements of biblical interpretation is to determine what the meaning of the Scripture meant first to the original audience. This is important for there are many things in the Bible that were given exclusively to certain people in specific frames of time. There are passages in the Bible that we will misunderstand and misapply if we don't first understand who the original recipients were. The opening of Matthew chapter 10 is one of these such passages. Jesus is organizing a special group of laborers that are called the 12 apostles. We also identify them as the 12 disciples. In fact, they're identified as both of these in verse 1 and in verse 2. These were the first missionaries. And as a result of this particular dispensation of time, they were given a unique power and authority from Jesus to do a unique work. Now, this is the beginning of what we would identify as the apostolic age. An apostle was simply one who saw with their own eyes the visible resurrected body of Christ. This is why there is no such thing as an apostle today. For no one living today has actually seen with their own eyes the resurrected body of Jesus. If anybody ever introduces you uh, to themselves as an apostle, be very wary of that mentality. For there are only very few apostles, and these would have only been alive during this particular dispensation of time. Now, a part of this special apostolic time that we see in the Gospels and much more frequently in the book of Acts is the authority to perform great works of power by the divine enablement of God himself. But as The remainder of the New Testament clearly shows us God has given to the rest of the church age different expressions of God's power, different responsibilities in His kingdom work. 
He has also given to us different missions than those of the 12 apostles received. For example, we look here in Matthew chapter 10 and verses 5 and 6. Jesus told these particular disciples to only minister to the Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't enter into a Samaritan City. Of course, we understand that that's not the extent of the gospel today, that the gospel today is to be given to all people. But in this particular dispensation, this particular unique mission, the, the disciples at this moment were only to go to the Jews. And of course, all of the 12 were called to die a martyr's death for, tw- for Jesus. And he is not necessarily asking of that for you and me today. My point is this. Unless we understand who God is talking to and the uniqueness of his work in that dispensation of time, then we will assume what? We will assume that God is also talking to us in that exact same term and expression. For instance, the the 12 apostles were given powers to heal people by their touch and by their word, but God has not given us that same power today. So, yes, the Lord is speaking here to all people, but but, but the initial audience, the original recipients, is why we apply certain things that we see written before us. Well, Pastor, I thought that all the Bible speaks to each one of us. It does. And the original 12 apostles are not the only people Jesus is talking to in Matthew chapter 10. He is also talking to us. But he is talking to us differently. He is talking to us in principles, not in the exact same specifics. Verse 8 is a prime example. Look at verse 8 of chapter 10. He tells the disciples, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That was a part of their mission. This is what Jesus is commanding for them to do. But Jesus has not empowered to us the ability to heal the sick and to raise the dead. What he has empowered us to do is the principle and the authority to meet the needs of people and to care for others. I share all of this with you because some would erroneously think that if Christians aren't doing these things written here, That if we aren't performing these miracles, then we must not be truly empowered by God. No, that's not the case at all. This was specifically given to the apostles. And what is given to us are the principles that Jesus sheds light on here as well as throughout the entire canon of Scripture. With all that being said, Matthew chapter 10 is an amazing chapter. These 12 men are the first missionaries trained by Jesus himself and sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And it's with this group that Jesus would use to structure the church as we know it today. The chapter can be divided into three sections. We'll not cover all of it this morning. The first section deals with a basic task of ministry. The second section deals with the reaction many people will have toward gospel ministry. And then the final section of chapter 10 gives a good summary of the personal cost that are involved in gospel ministry. I want us to look at the first section, which is the first 15 verses together this morning, and I want you to write down several things. Here's the first thing to write down. Number one, 12 disciples are called to help Jesus. Twelve disciples are called to help Jesus. Look at verse number one clearly. Here's what the Bible says. And when he had, what's that next word? Called unto him his 12 disciples. I want us to note that this calling was an answer to prayer. We highlighted this fact last Sunday evening in studying chapter 9 and verses 37 through 38. Go back and look at that with me. Chapter 9, verse 37, 38. Then saith Jesus unto his disciples, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray. Because of this, therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth workers, laborers into the harvest. So so Jesus tells them in these verses that the opportunities to make a gospel impact on the world are great, but the reality is the workers are few that are willing to do so. 
And so he then asked those disciples to pray that more will be sent, that more workers would come alongside of him and help him do the work of gospel ministry. We assume that they did indeed pray this. And now, as we come to chapter 10 and verse 1, those 12 men have become the answer to their own prayers. From the very next verse, Jesus calls them to the task. And when he had called them. And that's the next thing we note. That this calling was to share in his ministry. It was to share in his ministry. Up to this point, Jesus is the one pretty much doing it all. He's doing all the teaching, all the preaching, all the healing, if you will. Now now it's time for others to partner with him and to share in this ministry of making an impact for the gospel on this earth. Look at the last part of verse number one. He, he, He called unto him the disciples, and here's what he did. He gave them power. He gave them authority against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Verse 1 says, he called them unto him. Do you notice that there? He called them unto him. That is, he wanted these men to be with him. It's interesting change of scenery because up to this point, Jesus has given all of his attentions to the multitudes and now he is transitioning his attention to the multitudes to a select few, 12 to be exact. And he's going to use the majority of his time throughout the rest of the gospel teaching them and training them for the moment that they themselves will take his mission and spread it around the world after his death, resurrection, and ascension. Of course, this calling to be with him was first one of intimate fellowship. Not just a few hours during the week, but all Their time will be spent in closeness with Him. Think of this. They they will eat at the same table. They will sleep under the same roof. They will rest on the same hillside. Jesus wanted them to know Him and to learn from Him and to let His Word sanctify them. We never forget that this is always Jesus' first call to us. To be with Him. To be with Him in intimate fellowship. And when He had called unto Him, He called them to Himself. I hope, especially if you're a professing child of God this morning, that you understand and know the reality of intimate fellowship with Jesus. That your time with Him is not just something you do a few hours during the week, but you are walking with Him daily, and you are talking with Him daily, and you are learning from Him daily, and His Word is sanctifying your life daily. May we never forget that the number one thing God wants out of our lives is to be with Him in intimate fellowship. Have you been with Him today? beyond the singing of our corporate gathering, beyond the prayer, beyond this moment around His Word? Have you been with Him today? Were you with Him yesterday? Do you have an appointment with Him tomorrow? He's now going from the multitudes to just a few people that He can intimately, life on life, bring in closeness with Him. And then this calling to be with him was not only one of intimate fellowship, it was one of gospel partnership. To not just work for him, Jesus was calling these men to work with him. To share in the ministry, to share in preaching the gospel and healing all diseases and sicknesses and in preparing the people for the coming of God's kingdom. And what a great joy when our lives are in partnership with Jesus Christ. That's the calling of God, to be with Him and to go for Him, to be with Him and to share with Him in His work. And I pray as we reiterated last Sunday evening in looking at Matthew 9 that we are in some way 
and in some capacity helping Jesus in the work of the ministry. That we are sharing in some way this great calling that God has placed on our lives to follow his steps in doing his work around the world. It's a partnership. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. With God. It's not just a church partnership, an ecclesiastical one. It is a supernatural one. That God and I are partnering together this morning in the ministry of the Word. That Jesus and I will partner together tomorrow in the continued work of the gospel. The question is, have you partnered with Jesus in some way to serve him? Are you an observer of Jesus' ministry? Or are you a partnership with Jesus today? There's a great difference. And I'm afraid that even in our own congregations, we have far too many observers and a lot fewer partners. And so he calls them to be with him in intimate fellowship and then in gospel partnership. Notice number two, not only did he call 12 disciples to help him, secondly, he chose ordinary men. He chose ordinary men. These men over a period of only 18 months of intense training will become the instruments by which the message of Christ will be carried throughout the world. And what's fascinating about this, as well as encouraging it ought to be, is that they were simple men. They're ordinary men. I'm not going to read through the list again, but you can find it in verses 2 through 4, the 12 disciples that he identifies here. And one of the most obvious things that we learn through Scripture is that they were nobodies. Nobodies. These guys weren't celebrities. They they weren't intellectual giants. They, They were Galileans. And Galileans in this society were deemed as low class, rural, uneducated people. In fact, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the community perceived them as unlearned and ignorant men. Imagine that. The God of heaven starts his earthly ministry with 12 people whom the rest of the world thinks is a bunch of idiots. Nobodies. I like what John MacArthur said. God's favorite instruments are nobodies. Do you believe that? Listen to what the writer said, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. He says, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. Well, that starts off encouraging, doesn't it? (laughs) Paul says, look, look at your own calling. You can see how God doesn't choose very wise people. (laughs) He doesn't choose wise men out of the flesh. Not many who are mighty, not many who are noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise. He hath chosen the weak of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world, things that are despised hath God chosen. Yes, things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why has he done this? That no flesh should glory in his presence. God chooses nobodies. He uses ordinary people. Listen carefully. It's not strength that God is looking for. It's weakness. Some of you are waiting to come into partnership with God because you feel like there's some strength that needs to be developed, some strength that needs to be discerned out of your life. No, it's not strength that God is looking to capitalize on. It's your weakness. It's not greatness. It's your humbleness. It's not extraordinary people that he wants. It's ordinary people that he is looking for. And these men were every bit of that. They were weak. They were humble in the sense of low-class people. They were not extraordinary by any stretch of the imagination. They were very ordinary. 
And they were far from perfect. In fact, they are best described as thick headed, big mouthed, inconsistent, fault filled men who at times just didn't get what Jesus was teaching them. In fact, Jesus himself said of these men in Matthew chapter 15, You're a bunch of slow learners. But as Christ is with us, he was patient with them. After all, he chose them. He wasn't going to give up on them because of their imperfections. Every time they opened their mouth when they shouldn't have or jumped to conclusions or were fighting and fussing among themselves, Jesus was not going to throw them away and start all over with another group. No, he knew exactly who he had called, and he called them for that purpose. He chose them for a reason. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things for the work of God. In fact, I'm encouraged when I follow the training of Jesus with these disciples, even in periods of leadership in my own life. Consider how Jesus responded to their imperfections as he was training them. It's a great template for anyone who leads others. Whether you are a boss where you work and you have people underneath you, a pastor as myself, or any of us as parents can learn from these things. These disciples, they were they were slow to get the things the Lord is teaching them. My wife and I had this conversation last night in regards to parenting. It feels like we're saying the same things over and over and over and over again, and it's going in one ear and right out the other. And they return and say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And guess what happens tomorrow? They do it again. And we share with each other how similar our lives are that way with the Lord. We're slow learners. But how did Jesus respond to their slow learning? He just kept teaching them. He just kept teaching them. I mean, things that he taught over and over and over again, he continued to talk. Oh, by the way, even through all that teaching, when they were doubting him after his death and resurrection, he had to teach them the same things he had already been teaching them until they could finally get it. They were slow learners, but he kept teaching them. Their pride often got the best of them. How many passages have we read about them arguing among themselves who was going to be the greatest, right? I mean, they were arguing about that on the eve of his death. In fact, one of the moms got involved. Slipped a little note to Jesus saying, Can I request that my boys, one sit on the right hand and one on the other, just so prideful. Involving everything around themselves. Well, how did Jesus deal with that? How did he respond? Certainly, he kicked them out and started all over. No, 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 no. When their pride got the best of them, Jesus showed humility by serving them, by, by washing their feet, by showing them an example of humility. Then I think about how often they lacked faith during difficult times. Whether it was in a storm, whether it's denying the reality of his resurrection, but what did Jesus do? He just kept on displaying his power. He kept adding fuel to their faith, even though their faith was so weak. And of course, I look at the disciples and I see, and what is true of so many of us, they, they struggled with commitment, with commitment especially after his death. Do you remember what Peter said after he died? I go efficient. That's what he said. I go efficient. I'm done. I've wasted the last 18 months of my life. I thought he had come to set up an earthly kingdom and we were going to rule and reign and take back Israel from Rome. And now look at him. He's dead. I quit. Where's my fishing pole? By the way, it wasn't just a hobby for him. That was his business. It was his way of life. What he was saying is, I left my business for nothing. I'm going back to it. But what did Jesus do? Even in their lack of commitment, he prayed for them. He forgave them. And as he did with Peter, he does with so many of us, he restored them back to the ministry. This ought to encourage you today because God is not going to give up on you. 
like the disciples, we, all of us, we're slow learners. It takes us forever to figure it out. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll hear something preached for years, and it's like all of a sudden a light bulb goes off. Oh, that's what you meant, Lord. We get prideful. We make everything, life, the home, work, church, everything. We, we, we make it about us. We, we, we fail to trust Him when we ought to trust Him. Our commitment is very flaky. I mean, some months we won't miss anything. Then we're gone for months. And some weeks we'll read our Bible every day. And then for months we won't even pick it up. We're just like them. But Jesus doesn't give up on us. He's not looking for perfect people to make an impact for the gospel. All he wants is willing people. And that's what these 12 men were. They were willing to partner with Jesus in gospel ministry. They weren't chosen because of their intellect or their talents or their abilities. They were ordinary men who all had one thing in common, and that was a willingness to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make this point before I go to our last thought. Jesus chose these 12 men as his disciples for what they would become, not for what they were at the time of their call. He chose them for what they would become, not for what they were at the time of their call. And the same sentiment is true for each one of us today. If God was choosing people based upon what we were, He would have never chose me as a 15-year-old boy to preach His Word when I began to realize what God was doing in my life. I think back at some of those messages I preached before I even graduated high school, and I blush. I'm embarrassed. I found a sermon from when I was in college roaming around the Internet, and I tried to find the source and said, take that thing down. I don't want people. That's not who I am anymore. Take it down. Even as a pastor. Even as a pastor. I have said to our media team from time to time, you know, I preached a sermon back in 2000 and whatever. Let's, uh, I don't really think that anymore. Let's take that off the Internet. By the way, same is true for all of us in our marriages. I know my wife didn't marry me for who I was. She married me for who she thought she could make me to be. (laughs) And she realizing that's not very easy to do. Sometimes we'll have conversations even about our own relationship together, and I'm so embarrassed about how I treated her and how obstinate I was in the early days of our marriage and how lazy I was to help her around the house or whatever the case may be, fill in the blank. But as it is in all relationships, God takes us through growth and maturity. We look at these 12 men the same way everybody else looked at them. He wants those guys? He wants them? Oh, it wasn't because of necessarily who they were at the moment, but for who he knew he would make them to be. And I'm grateful that God's saving grace in my life, his calling to partnership and ministry is not about who I am in the moment. It's who he has saved me to become. It's who he is sanctifying my heart to achieve for him. It's just ordinary men. And it's just ordinary men like you that he wants. Would you write down number three? We'll finish with this. We're talking about the first missionaries. The first missionaries. He called these missionaries to help him. He chose not the great and extraordinary. He chose the weak and the ordinary. And thirdly, he sent them out with basic instructions. He sent them out with basic instructions. We see this in verses 5 all the way down through verse 15. But let's just begin at verse 5. Look at what he says there. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them. 
He sent forth and commanded them. Remember, these are the first missionaries. They have been called by Jesus to help him in gospel ministry. He has chosen them as ordinary men to do extraordinary things. Now, on their first mission, he gives them some very basic instructions on how to go about their work of gospel ministry. Although the specifics may not be commanded for us today, and what I mean by that is God would even change these things for another mission later. In other words, the things he's asking them to do in specific measures, he will ask them to do in just a few weeks later. So, so these are not hardened, wooden, unchangeable things. Again, these are, these are principles. We, we take them seriously as we do the work of gospel ministry today. Let's, let's begin with the first one. The first principle in verses 5 through 8 is this. Stick to the mission. Stick to the mission. Verse 5, he sent them forth. He commanded them. Here's what he said. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, nor any city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils. You have freely been given these things. Freely give them back. The mission was simple, right? In summary, what Jesus was saying, you have a people that I have called you to reach. Go to that people and do as you have seen me do. Teach the scriptures, preach the gospel. And meet people's needs. The truth is today, we cannot be distracted in what God has commissioned us to do as individual people or as a local New Testament church. We must stay on mission. God has given us a people for us to reach. Let's go to those people and let's preach the word. Let's enjoy the fellowship that God has given us. Let's live the gospel in every way that we can live it. Let's keep our eyes on the mission. It's easy to get distracted, isn't it? Looking at things, focusing on things that don't matter. It's easy to get distracted as a church, putting things on the calendar, entertaining uh, concepts and ideas that really don't help us fulfill the purpose of preaching the Word and, and, and living the gospel. And so Jesus kind of gently comes in and says, stay on mission. You have a mission. You have a people. You have a responsibility. Stick to the mission. Jared is here with us this morning. It's the same principle for his work in Cornelius. Go to Cornelius. Go to North Meck County. Stay on mission. Start a church. Preach the gospel. Help those people. This is who I've called you to. This is what I want you to do. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Stick to the mission. Secondly, have faith in my provision. Have faith in my provision. These are basic instructions. Look at verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes nor yet stobs for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, this is not a blanket prohibition of certain material aspects of life. That's not what Jesus is commanding here. For one, Jesus would later tell them to actually take these things, okay? So if these things were bad in and of themselves, then he would have just said, always stay away from them. So the gold and the silver he's saying to leave behind on the first mission is also the gold and the silver he tells them to pick up on the second mission. The message that Jesus is given here is that certain things help us stick to the mission. And one of them is keep, keep your mission simple. In the terms of material things, he's saying don't take so much with you that it would be difficult to stick to the mission. That's why he tells them not to take two pair of shoes, but one pair of shoes, ladies. By the way, I probably have as many pairs of shoes as my wife does, to be quite honest with you. Don't take two pair of shoes. Don't take two coats. Don't feel so much of your purse with all this gold and silver and maps and all these things that, you, that you're just going to get distracted. Don't, don't do that. Just take the simple necessities. That's, that's all you need on this first mission. And perhaps like many of us would, we would wonder, well, how are we going to make it? What if one pair of shoes gets dirty? And that's when Jesus comes along and basically says, don't worry, God will provide your needs along the way. 
I'm afraid that many aren't involved in God's mission today because they're so distracted by material things that they simply don't trust God to provide for them. I can't serve the Lord. I can't join the church. I can't be involved in this ministry because I've got all these other things going on. And if I'm not involved in all of these other things, then how am I going to survive in life? And that is often the problem. Is that things have become our God. We're not trusting the Lord. We're not having faith in his ability to provide for us. The first missionaries and any missionary for that matter will only be successful in his efforts for the kingdom when he is fully trusting God to provide. Stick to the mission. Have faith in my provision. Number three, treat people with integrity. Treat people with integrity. Verse 11, and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And why would Jesus tell them this? Because false teachers and religious leaders were very quick in this day to mistreat people. They would take advantage of their hospitality. There's no hotels like we know it. Most times when I go to preach for uh, conferences and pastors, they'll put me up in a little hotel somewhere around the corner from the church like we do with guests here, primarily because I snore rather loudly. And to have me in their home would be a clear disruption to their nightly sleep. It was different in these days. There's no place to put them, and so they would stay in homes. And what the false teachers would do is they would move from house to house, exploiting the kindness of others by manipulating them for financial gain and earthly convenience. And once they got what they wanted, they moved on to the next house. Jesus is telling his disciples, don't even think about doing that. You respect people, and whoever is kind enough to have you in their home while ministering in that city, you stay there and don't run out to the next place just because it may be better over there. If someone is gracious enough to keep you in their home, and it's a two-bedroom situation with no coffee and no swimming pool or whatever, and then the guy two days later with the coffee and the five bedrooms and the swimming pool says, hey, come stay over here. We got plenty of room and a whole lot more for you to enjoy. Jesus said, don't do it. You stay right there with those people who have been kind and gracious enough to you to give what little they have to help you in the ministry. Treat people with integrity. It's a great life principle in all of our relationships and dealings with others. That as ambassadors of God, we must live with personal integrity as well as relational integrity in how we treat other people. Too much of God's mission has been hindered today by those who have served without integrity. And this is very basic. Stick to the mission. Have faith in my provision. Treat people with integrity. And then finally, he says, Focus on those who are receptive. Focus on those who are receptive. Verse 13, if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust. For verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Here's the essence of what Jesus is saying. He says that when we go, that we are to be compassionately persuading others, not forcefully provoking others. It's very important in our evangelistic endeavors. God has not called us to forcefully provoke. He's called us to compassionately persuade. And if they are not persuaded by the message of the gospel, then Jesus says don't fret. Don't take it personal. It's hard to do, isn't it? Don't fret. Don't take it personal. Simple, simply leave it in God's hands of future judgment and then move on to the next individual or family that is openly receptive to your message. This is a good word, church, for so much of our attention, especially as leaders at times, is consumed by those who are not receptive, those who are not committed. 
It becomes a distraction. Listen, this is a constant battle of the flesh. God has used some of you to lead some people to the gospel as a result of your faithful gospel initiatives and endeavors, but then how we get so restless toward those that we keep talking to, and it's like they... They don't want to hear nothing we have to say. And it's, it's those individuals that consume our minds rather than helping intimately and being grateful for those who have received the message. As a pastor, I can tell you what. This is, Jared, Jared knows this. My wife knows this more than any of you do. My, my, my biggest struggle as a pastor is this point right here. I trust the Lord. I feel like most of the time I'm, I'm, I'm on mission I'm not perfect, but I've tried to live my life treating people with integrity. But this right here, I struggle. You go home on a Sunday evening after an all day of giving your life to gospel ministry. How easy and quick it is for me to think about who wasn't there again. Instead of being grateful for those of you who are. It's a struggle. How easy it is in the middle of my week to get so consumed and wrapped up by the nasty emails. And then to go to my mailbox this week, Miss Phyllis, and pull out one of the most encouraging notes I've ever received in my life. And not to be grateful for those things. In parenting, it's the same way, right? So easy to stay awake at night thinking about the things that our children repetitively disobey and ignore while taking very little time to praise and encourage and congratulate obedience to the glory of God. I don't think I'm the only one who struggles with this, but I tell you, it is a struggle. We say things like, well, only one made a decision. <laughs> but what Jesus is saying, you don't worry about those who aren't making the decision because their day's coming. Don't worry about those who aren't committed today because their day of reckoning is coming. Don't worry about those who keep rejecting the gospel. It's going to be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. You stay focused on those who are open to the word and glad to receive the message. Keep Helping them to the glory of God. Don't worry about the ones who've said no. It's basic. It's basic. Focus on those who are sent. I think it gives one additional hint that not only should we be focusing our time and energy on those who are gladly receiving our message, but we should also be practicing faithful endurance in the face of rejection. My father-in-law often signs his letters I've gotten many of those through the years. But a little salutation. Press on. Never quit. Press on. Never quit. That's what Jesus is saying. As you go out sharing in this ministry, ambassadors for me, preaching the gospel, press on and never think about it. Although this is where we will stop today, it's not the last thing Jesus has to say to this group of 12 as they prepare to go out as co-laborers in the gospel work. But it's enough for us today to stop and consider a few things. And those few things are simple. Are you praying for more workers to make a gospel impact in this world? Talked about that last Sunday evening, didn't we? Chapter 10 is a direct response to their prayers in chapter 9. Are you praying for that? You want to see more missionaries go out of our church? Are you praying for that? You want to see more people saved? Are you praying for that? You want to see more people in the, in the uh, band? Might as well call it what it is. Pray for that. You want to see more people in the choir? Pray for that. You want to see more seats that are empty beside you filled up? Are you praying for that? Are you willing yourself to 
be a worker who serves the Lord in whatever capacity he has designed for you in whatever place that he sends you? Are you a partner with Jesus or just an observer of Jesus? Are you running this race with him? Are you on the sidelines or are you on the field? Are you sharing in this responsibility? For those of us who are and can honestly say that we are, the challenge is this morning, stick to the mission. As you go, trust God for your provisions. Make sure you're always treating people with integrity. And don't quit focus on and be grateful for those who are responding and receiving. Don't be like me and get down over those who aren't. It's basic. And that's important because Jesus is fixing to tell them as we come to verse 16 that I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. It won't be an easy mission. And we'll come to that next Sunday.